Attention aspiring musicians of all levels from all over the world. Want to learn to play guitar or bass like your heroes? Well, I have the guy for you. Multi-instrumentalist Corey Glazer has played with Fastball, Paula Nelson, Skyrocket, me, and many more. In fact, his song Needle Hits the Groove is our theme song. Corey's been teaching for over two decades and is now offering his services all over the world via Zoom. So if you want to learn rock, country, R&B, or funk, folk, or jazz on guitar or bass, just go to CoreyGlazer.com or follow the link in the text of this podcast and start shredding on guitar or slapping the bass like a pro with Corey Glazer at CoreyGlazer.com. Let's get down. Attention Austin musicians and music industry professionals, are you having a difficult time navigating these waters, especially after the coronavirus and all the clubs have been closed? You don't know what to do? Well, let me tell you about a great resource for you. That's the Austin Music Foundation. Austin Music Foundation provides ongoing artist development services through its educational panels, one-on-one consultations, and online resources. Now listen, gang, all of that stuff is available to you, the artist or music industry professional, for free. And since coronavirus hit back in March and everything is closed down, Austin Music Foundation had the forethought to move all of their programs online. That's right. You can watch panels online. You can do your consultations online. Austin Music Foundation is there for you, and it's all free to you, the artist. Just go to austinmusicfoundation.org. That's austinmusicfoundation.org. Get involved. Hello, I'm Johnny. I'm your host. Welcome to the show. I hope you guys all had a good weekend, whatever it is you're doing this weekend. I had a great weekend. I actually went to, uh, I had a gig in Houston on Saturday, so I went down early on Friday and hung out at my aunt's house in Conroe with my grandma and my aunt and uncle. My cousin Emily came by. We all had a great lunch. Then I went to my cousin Jennifer's house uh, in Houston and spent the night. I, we had fajitas. We sat around the fire and listened to songs outside on her porch. It was really awesome. Really awesome. She made cookies. And I tried. I heard she and her fiancé are into these craft beers. And I'm not like a big beer guy. Um, I've been getting into some mezcal. In fact, <laughs> I got into some mezcal last night. Um, but I, uh, I, I tried these beers that, that are killer, man. They're into these craft beers. I had a coffee beer. Uh, my cousin Jennifer was having this one that was like graham cracker and vanilla. It was just unbelievable beers. I don't know if I could drink like a whole bunch of them, but having one is like, it's almost like a dessert. It's nice. Anyway, Saturday, uh, Skyrocket played a wedding in Houston. And uh, it was really good. It was a lot of fun. You know, it was nice. Uh, the, the bride and groom were so happy and sweet and and nice and and their crowd was really nice and they kept their distance they weren't weird and they weren't freaking us out with the you know it's difficult to do this shit right now it's the second weekend i played a wedding the one last weekend i told you guys was freaky but the one this last weekend was was really really good it was really fun and uh i drove back after the show on sunday or on saturday night sorry and uh and and had a great sunday as i said i got into a little mezcal last night it was good it was good, you know, uh, uh, with, you know, with like flavored seltzer water, you know, like a watermelon water and like a, that's, that's nice. Go down, sit by the lake, listen to some tunes, make fun of joggers and walkers with your loved one. It was a pretty good weekend all around. So gang, I have a great show for you guys today. The amazing Graham Wilkinson returns to the show, my dear friend. He's got a brand new album out called Cut So Deep. It's available now wherever it is that you stream and download your jams. Uh, we have a fantastic conversation about uh, about the album, about making the album, about uh, about his it's sort of how his family informs his music and his family life informs his music and his love of his family informs his music. It really does. Like there's a very familial vibe to what Graham Wilkinson does. And I think that, that that attracts a lot of people. He's got a very lovely wife. He's got beautiful twin girls. He's got an older daughter that has a fiance doing. It's just, he's got a lovely family scene. He's got a lovely thing with his with his parents. 
I know this sounds funny to say this, but I'm being serious. Like, it really informs his music and who he is as a person because he's a very soulful. He writes from him, you know, deep inside of himself. And that's one of the things that I love about Graham Wilkinson. And I think that that's what he really connects with. That's why people really connect with him is what I mean. Sorry. That's why he connects with people, you know, because you feel that thing. Anyway, we have a fantastic conversation. This album, Cuts So Deep, is gorgeous. You can find him at, at GrahamWilkinsonMusic.com. He's going to be doing, so he does some outside shows, some places. He does a little, like some brewery stuff. And, uh, and I think he's, he might be getting into the uh, live stream ga- uh, game. I don't, I don't know if he is or not. I wonder if the live stream game is going to keep on going after this. What do you think? Anyway, my conversation with Graham Wilkinson is, is really, really good. I always have a great time talking to Graham Wilkinson. And so uh, without further ado, please enjoy us chatting it up. Let's get down. I love when I see a rainbow Made from the colors under the sun Oh, how I wish I was a rainbow Where all the colors shine as one I'm doing good, man. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Good. I think so. Yeah. 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 How, how are you doing? Uh, I'm, <clears throat> I'm great. Today feels, yesterday and today it felt very, um, uneventful, you know, like the, uh, getting ready for the release of a record, uh, Normally we'd be going on tour or, or doing something like that, but yeah. you release the record and then it's like, oh yeah, uh, what day am I watching my sister's kids this week again? And <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what do the girls have to do that they maybe didn't get done some form to fill out? And I mean, we had to do our, uh, the girls yearbook pictures at home the other day cause they didn't do the, uh, and they're not in school right now. Um, so that's crazy. So there's always, it's always something. It's just been a whirlwind the last couple weeks. Uh, and before that, there was a blizzard or something in Texas. Yes. And everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And not only that, they took away all our cool shit for a year or however long it's been. It's been a year. My last gig, the last gig I played in front of people uh, was March 13th. And Oddly enough, the first gig I'm playing in front of people is March 13th. So I 13th. literally had 365 days off. <laughs> well, I'm thinking about it. I think it was this weekend. It was like March 8th of last year. I did. Um, I had some offers right before South by to do like all the rustics in San Antonio and Austin and Houston and Dallas, but they were kind of not in any order. And I just remember reading in all kinds of international news about this virus that <laughs> yeah, was spreading. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I talked to my buddy, Justin, and I'm like, ah, I'm, not, I'm not too, I don't feel too good about this, but you know, we'll see after this weekend. And it was that after that weekend, everything shut down. Yeah. And, uh, outside of like, I played like a uh, Vista brewing out in, in Driftwood, uh-huh. you know, super outdoors and spread apart. And, Low key, I don't really announce that I'm playing it or anything. It's just you know they ask if I'm available, I go do that. But yesterday, uh, Saturday was the first show, and and about you know in, in the year outside of some Zoom, you know. Uh, right, right, Zoom. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been singing to my phone. <laughs> That's me in my backyard, just <laughs> two times a week, and. Uh, and when I and when I feel like oh no one cares, I'm like shut up and do your job. Just get out there, play some songs for just a little bit. You haven't played the guitar all week. That's what I, I mean. That's really what happens. Also, you know, uh, can go a whole week without picking up the guitar, but except for the the happy hour on Thursday and the brunch show on Sunday. Um, but anyway, well, congratulations! This album's gorgeous. It really is, man. I listened to it. Uh, when they first sent it to me and then I listened to it twice today and it's, there's a, is it weird that it seems to me in your music 
you get the fact that your uh, family means something to you? No, that's a, it's a huge point, man. It's, mean, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's It seems to be a theme through your whole the life. Like yeah. ev- every everything you do is kind of informed by that, isn't it? A hundred percent. You know, that could go into a lot of different, you know, things from that. But I'll say, yes, it is very important. And, you know, my mom and dad just, um, you know, sitting down to have family dinner. We were sitting, even if everybody's angry at each other. And, you know, uh, Aaron and I were in a fight and Sarah, you know, and and, and uh, the the value in that that I think I saw early on um, just seeing other families who didn't have that kind of relationship. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, uh, whether it's a kid doesn't like the parent or the parents don't like each other or someone's gone, you know what I'm right, saying? Someone's right. not around anymore. They just don't have that family. Um, my brother and I, I remember being in high school and he was in college and my sister was in middle school and we were having a talk in the kitchen one late night. And uh, he kind of told both of us, you realize how lucky we are, right? My brother was telling us this, you know, just in whatever it was that had happened to him made him feel the need to express that to us. He, he said, you realize that, you know, we all really love each other and care about each other. And there's a lot of people that don't have that experience with family. And, you know, Johnny, like back in the day, we'd just be hugging each other and can't stop seeing each other. And there's a lot of people who are like, please don't hug me. No. It's like, Oh yeah, there's, there's all kinds of levels of, uh, of just uh, the, the intimacy and the camaraderie and the just uh, fellowship and the connection. And I am fortunate for it. And, uh, you know, over the years coming back from a tour or something, when sometimes we'd have to leave from the person who lives in the direction of the area out of town. Right. Right. Leaving. Yeah. 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 yeah no. <laughs> And it took a couple of years, quite a few years, where I said, no, we're leaving from my house, okay? Everybody, yeah. we're just getting, even if it's because I really need that to be my departure to say goodbye and to come home, to not have to be like in Cedar Park and then still drive home the rest of the way. Right, and right. I also noticed how special it was for a lot of bandmates and stuff to see, you know, Don Aaron's making everybody sandwiches as we get in the car and the kids are like talking to the bandmates and it's, uh, and how much I miss them when I'm gone. So yeah, hundred percent. I'll just keep rambling about that. No, I think that's a beautiful thing. And it's a thing that as I've gotten to know you as a person and uh, in our longer and deeper conversations on here and stuff that, uh, that, that is, that is who you are. And the one thing that I wondered, and you just answered it for me is that, uh, well, I was just going to ask if it was before your, your, brother's death if that was something that you were cognizant of or is that something that you adapted to afterwards but you answered it already you guys were yeah yeah it brought us closer though i'll say that to my mom and my dad my uh sister and i so death's uh any kind of death you know someone who dies you know what i'm saying it's like i can bring people together or push people further apart because people don't we don't really talk about death that much in our culture uh so yeah anyways it is uh, it is wild, and my mom and dad got to come out to the show, but my sister didn't because she had work and she had to take care of her little girl. And you know how bummed she was, and how bummed I was that she wasn't there. And it's like, yeah. oh, but my mom and dad got to be there, and uh, they haven't done anything like that in over a year, also. So it was great. That's good, man. Um, yeah. So let's talk about cut so deep. You, you, uh, when did you do this? Did you record it during the thing? <laughs> About half during the thing, yeah. There's a couple of different levels. There's, I would say, about half of it when you look at it. Yeah, uh, is is during the last, you know, from 2019 to to now, uh, right? As, um, but then the other half, the first four songs, uh, one of them. I think I started, you know, all my, I think it says it even in the bio, even though I didn't like the way it read, but it was like almost five years ago that I, that I wrote the song. Right, right. After the last album came out. Yeah. And that's just, you know, when you get done with the record, 
You're, I mean, there's already projects I'm working on right, right, right. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's, uh, in all of 2017 to 2021, I, or to, to 2020, I was working with a lot of other projects, the House of Songs. I was working with Nolan Wheeler and this side project we have called Labor Department. I was working with uh, another friend in songwriting and I was doing guitar lessons. And so there's all these songs that kind of slip through the cracks that, oh, Two years later, you still think to yourself, I really should do something with this song. I like this song. I think it, and it wasn't until the pandemic that I started to see how some of them could fit together. uh, One or two of these older ones. And then uh, as I was writing more songs during lockdown, I kind of did see the vision of how it all could fit. I was like, I really think we could. And Patrick, the uh, producer, my best buddy, he was like, you know how I feel about albums, man. You know, he was like, there's no need to do an album anymore. You know, it's like, we're yeah. kind of on different <laughs> uh, But I love him to death and I trust him, but he's, I was like, this is something I got to do. And it kind of seemed like there's the, um, the stubborn, uh, uh, you know, the artists of uh, just, uh, this is what I had to do. I had to get it out. And then it turned into so much more than that as it took shape. Um, did any did like is there any 2020 pandemic lockdown stuff in that record yeah well um i mean rainbow is definitely one okay. don't leave me now was, yeah 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 was written right at uh right before everything shut out because that was recorded in january of 2020 and uh then what is the other ones um I mean, there are a, there are a couple songs that when you look at, we did like "Lucky" and "Funny Feeling" were done during this past summer for Viva Big Ben for Texas Music Magazine, and those are ones that we those there's, there's recordings of, but they were never done correctly, never done the way that we could when we had the band, and you know even if we were trying to track it out. So those are the newer, fresh verses. We got the horns on there, and. Um, you know, uh, I mean, Balcony is definitely the uh, okay, the last yeah, song on the record. Yeah, and and this town, this town is another one that kind of was breathed new life into. Um, the Balcony was written towards the end of uh, 2019 uh, after being in LA one weekend and working with Nolan. And you know, when you have like a verse third for months and you're it's just this thing you still have it and you remember it and you go golly i mean what a disservice to this song but you, you don't you don't know where 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 it's supposed to go or what it's supposed to do and when it hits you uh i mean i wrote the, the chorus and the second verse in like an hour and that was definitely full lockdown um Summer Rainbow was written in June, right after George Floyd was murdered. Yeah, right before the eighteenth. You, you get that in Rainbow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little, a little on the nose. Yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> um, with House of Songs, like, are you? Are they? They're still doing stuff, right? Honestly, I don't know, man. That was in uh, twenty seventeen and eighteen. They uh, Troy and Graham Weber uh, put together this thing with. Albert E. Brumley's family in Arkansas, uh-huh. where I was reading about Albert that. E. Brumley. Yeah, he wrote "I'll Fly Away," the most popular gospel song ever in 1933, up in the Ozarks. He also wrote, you know, uh, uh, "Gentle on My Mind." No, no, no. Uh, what's the the Glenn Campbell one that he did? Anyways, the point is, Albert E. Brumley. They found all these songs he hadn't finished, and. Uh, they, Troy and Graham got some, Akina Adderley, Don and Hawks and me teamed up with some Australians to try and finish his songs. And so for a couple of years, every couple of months, there was another thing on that in the documentary. Right. And in between that, I was working with Nolan. And so I know that, uh, I, th- I saw something that the House of Songs was doing the other day, but I know that they're Still hindered in people, yeah. hindered in people coming in from all right, over the right. world because of the lockdown. But, uh, but great organization. What a Super great organization. People. Yeah. Um, so uh, what are you doing? Like your record just came out on Friday. So yeah. what are you, like you played a show on Saturday. Okay. Yeah. 
you're talking, so what? talking to your old pal Johnny on the computer now. <laughs> what what else are you able to do to I, I actually I read a really great uh, review in uh, in uh, American Songwriter magazine. Mm. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. And Lynn did, did a piece on that. Yeah. American Songwriter. Did, yeah. yeah. So what are you um, what are you able to do? Like. OK, well, here's the thing. Uh, there's all kinds of, I mean, they even had, didn't they have an award this, this year for Austin, like the best pivot, the best, you know, yeah. someone who just did something. Yeah, yeah. It's like, that's a great thing because we all, some people go head first into, uh, tele zoom, zoom things and shows and doing online shows. And it's like, I'd never done a live stream until the lockdown. So that right. shows, yeah, just Me never neither. done one. I'd never and, even thought of it. I was like, why would you do that? That's weird. <laughs> You're like, well, you could play in your home. Like I could also, you know, drive to some other place and play a show. Yeah. Um, you know, Johnny, that's the, the question is, is like, you know, I, you know, even d- despite what's happening just currently with whatever, with the, the mask mandate, not being, you know, we don't have to wear them now is what people is what the, the I mean, I and just some of the conversations I've had with my band members about that, about how some of these guys have been playing indoors, and then myself, I haven't played a show indoors in over a year, and I'm not going to until things change. But when that happened, just have the, the anxiety and the stress and the pressure of like, oh, there's, no, there's just one more thing, right? When we think we're getting to another stage of being okay, whether it's uh how are we going to do this or what are we going to do? Your question of what are we, what am I going to do? I mean, yes, I do have the purple BTV live stream this Saturday, the 13th, which is, I mean, their productions are great. It's, it's a fun thing. It's way better than just me and my phone in the backyard with the yeah. wind chimes. And, the, right, right. <laughs> uh, and you know, the, there are, there's a few more private events that are coming up, which always have helped sustain yeah. this lifestyle and this career. But you know, there, there, there are inquiries right now from venues in places like Arkansas and Oklahoma and Louisiana and Mississippi. And it's just, no, I don't, I don't, every day that passes, I less, there's less of a desire to be on the road uh, ever. And, uh, you know, as much as it, it just, it's not going to happen until things are, are, are way different. And, um, you know, I don't know, man. I, I, I did. I will say this. I needed to get this record out because I know that these songs needed to live together in this form. And, you know, there's this weird psychological artistic desire that as long as I had one kind of release every year over the last, you know, 15, 16, 17 years, it just was not as validating, but it was it. It, it made me feel productive, I guess. It was, you know, I guess it is validating, but, you know, it's like, oh, I did do something, but you it, know? It also adds a structure that <clears throat> I don't think a lot of people understand. Like, there are people that are like, uh, oh, you should you should go out to the country and just stay out there and write songs. Write songs. I won't fucking do anything. <laughs> like, I'll smoke weed and walk around and take naps. That's exactly what I'll do in that situation. There has to be really some do. kind of structure. And I think that your release thing sets up that kind of structure. So you're always moving forward and going towards the next thing as opposed to just walking around in circles. Dude, you know, this has just stuck with me there. I mean, all Andres Cabeda, like almost anything he says, it just sounds like, you know, just straight wisdom from the mouth of a God. Always. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. always. And so one time he just said, it was a, it was an album that I was trying to put together. And he goes, are these the best songs you've ever written? I was like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. And he goes, well, why, why would you make an album? If I'm phrasing it right, why would you make an album if they aren't the best songs you've ever done? And it's not the best album you've ever done. And I just, dead space i didn't know what to say you know and then yeah, i think it was a year and a half later after your book was released and he sang on that record and uh he thought that he knew that i could answer him then when i was like yes these are the best songs i have written just to let you know i would love to have you on one of them and he was gracious enough to do that and it was so awesome but like right after the release 
I think one of his com- uh, questions was like, what are you working on now? Like we right, just right, did right. the record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he was like, you, you never stop. I mean, it was kind of, this, this is over yeah. a decade ago that he, kind of like welcome to the club. Like, you know, you've, you've done however many records now, Graham, but this is not something that you stop doing. Now, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And so this metaphysical philosophical approach to uh, uh, what it is to be a songwriter and your responsibilities and like, you know, you can be all distressed about it or you can just keep going and, and, and be okay with who you are. Yeah. <laughs> as hard as that is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that dude is uh, Alejandro Escobedo is so cognizant of his role in this community and in our lives that he feels like it's almost like a, you know, like a, a guy from an upperclassman, you know, that's like the valedictorian or something, you know, and he comes up like, Hey, what are you doing? Is this up. the best you can do? All right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, he's like, it's okay if it is. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can live with yourself yeah. like that. I love that about him, man. Oh man, such, such a huge influence uh, and such a great songwriter too. Uh, and um, you know, I mean, Johnny, I mean, what am I going to do? Like, I just got uh, kind of in the mix of things, getting ready for the record, the checklist of things you normally do, getting some new merch. I haven't had merchandise in like five years. There's all kinds of people that ask about old shirts. I'm like, I'm not reprinting those shirts and whatever. Just, just I'll make something new. Or, ordering the CDs, getting the vinyl done, getting the merchandise ordered. It didn't slow down long enough to think like, well, I don't have any shows. It's like, right, right, I'm gonna, right, right, right. We're going to do it. And there are a lot of people that are very enthusiastic about the record and the hoodies and all this stuff. But the other day I got a box of merch from the warehouse that all the merch has been up in Dallas in the warehouse just for the pre-sale and everything. <laughs> And I just haven't gotten a box of merch on the door in so long. And then, you know, it's like, oh, gosh, this is a lot of stuff. And then I did have kind of an oh shit moment of like, what am I going to do now? Um, i got to start slinging some uh, some stuff. But uh, oh, excuse me. Um, if you would have done that, if you would have done what you just did, sneeze. And we were in here, would have ended the fucking podcast. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah, great. You with, with uh with this stuff, yeah. Sorry, static screen. You know what's funny is that you took it. You took this time off from doing new merch, and you're literally the person. I've seen uh, laugh until life makes sense. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> is it still out there? Of you and it Bob. Is. You and Bob Schneider have the most merch you see. Wow. To me. That's that's not a bad uh, company. No. Like Chili Duck. That's, uh, yeah, he's he's pretty dang prolific with the, the merch uh, production. Uh, there's, dude, one, one of the runs I went with him years ago when we were in Alabama or something, he just looked so focused. And I was like, what are you, what, what are you doing? Like, I'm just nosy. I, I thought he was like typing a paper or something. And he's doing some kind of Photoshop editing with images and stuff, all of the art that he does. But it was pretty wild to kind of see it happen because I am a complete novice with all of that. Uh, yeah. And it was just another one I was working on. And just as I was like, oh, I can't sit down for a minute without going crazy. Uh, yeah. But, Did you ever know him when he I'm, drank? Huh? Did you ever know him when he drank? In the nineties. No, I think uh, I think I met him. No, I know I met him right after I quit, <laughs> which is fine. He he, that tremendous amount of energy was just had turned on him, and he was in this like all that energy of output that he puts out at one point was just running around inside of him like a lunatic, and not you know what I mean. Yeah, he was a yeah. he was a, such a different guy. Well, dude, Johnny, I mean, look at that. Look at you. I mean, we'll just look at all of us. I mean, there's I don't know. I guess that's why that pivot thing is is yeah. a thing. It's like there's a there's a thing that you know wh- whether it's people getting sober or people like whatever the life change is. I mean, sometimes you know I was thinking about a, a friend, a songwriter 
and then trying to find out where they were because I hadn't heard from them in a while. And they're just back in Arkansas working. They're not playing music anymore. And I'm it's like, why, why don't you do that anymore? And they're just like, they just didn't do it. And, you know, I'm like, what are you doing with all of this stuff that we, you know, anyways, it's just, it's a, it's a wild thing. Like there's some friends that won't accept uh, who they, that they are a songwriter, that, 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 that it is a part of who they are and they can still have a normal job. It, you know, I'm, I have found that I am very needed around the house. Uh, and it is, you know, it's a weird thing to read about the silver lining and the positive uh, things that have come out of this, this devastating uh, virus and how it has happened. But, you know, there are some things with my kids and them working their responsibilities around the house. That's gone up. Good. Hey, me being here and not being gone all the time has positively impacted the relationship with my wife and kids. It, yeah, do you think it'd be a bad idea to just be gone every single weekend for three or four days? Yeah, it can, it'll definitely have an effect. So uh, there are some good things that have come about and I don't know what, uh, what we got next, but uh, you know, I think these outdoor things, there's enough venues being good about it and people are trying, people want to be back out. I mean, everybody who said what you just said, I haven't done anything in a year. And it's like, what do I have to do? Okay, I'll do it. I, Let's go hang out. I, but, I uh, I didn't do anything for, uh, until I would occasionally like when Scrappy Judd Newcomb comes to town. Uh-huh. I I hang out with him. Yeah, like that. I'll take a coronavirus for that guy. Um, <laughs> but my grandmother uh, was freaking out and was going fucking nuts, and she's ninety seven years old, and she like mm-hmm. in August was like, "Hey, you guys want to spend Christmas at the beach?" And we were like, uh, "Yeah," and she was like, "All right." She called back a little while later and she was like, I have a beach house on the beach in Galveston because she, she couldn't stand looking out her fucking window all day. And she was like, if I'm going to look out the window, I'm going to see like the ocean and sand and mm-hmm. this shit. So she uh, she got a house for the month of December and basically oh, was wow. like, go get tested. And then you're negative. You're welcome to live here for the month. Everyone in the family. Oh, my so, God. You know, my cousin, Emily. Emily, I was going to say, did y'all all go down oh, there? Dude, me and Emily, me and Emily were like, we were there the whole time. We were fucking, <laughs> dude, the place had a hot tub. It had two porches. We drank all day, hung out with my grandma and her mom and some of our other aunts and uncles and cousins. And, but me and Emily were there. Me and Emily didn't leave. The whole time. Till the end, yeah. Were you waiting on your grandma to get there? You were just waiting in the driveway. We're like, you're no, here. No, Emily was. I got there like 10 minutes after they got there. Yeah. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah. what I was going to say is when I came back from that, I realized that there, there, there are ways to interact and live still uh, and, and be as safe as possible. Like, I mean, I go to the grocery store and to me, that's almost more dangerous to me the way that it works than going to Cosmic and sitting oh, at yeah. a table like with one person that, you know, is cool. And, you know, I mean, those kinds of things were I just, you know, my both of my parents got vaccinated last month. I mm-hmm. think they got both of their shots and it was a strange, the sigh of relief that I yes. just like. It's the way. Thank God. Right. You know, um, and. You know, even even my some of my bandmates, like the show uh, Saturday. You know, like one of them had a mask on, and the other one was about to, and then one of them didn't, and they were like, "We supposed to be putting these on while we're playing and stuff." I'm like, well, "Would you like?" Actually, I think we're okay, but I can't just keep thinking about this right. while I'm playing. You know, right. and it's like I felt weird getting close to Mark on the sax, even though he had part of his mask on and trumpet had his, I mean, trumpet tiger had his mouthpiece for his trumpet in his mask hanging out. So he would just push it in and still play with the mask on. And it was mind blowing, but just going and say, like, all right, we did that. And if they opened up the plastic flaps on the side of the, of the, of the big tent, I would feel so much better because it's a big stage, but seeing that, even I don't want to say anxiety, but just how maddening it is to just everything that you're thinking about, like trying to be thoughtful of others, other people trying to do this. It's like really the social nature of being just being a person 
to see other people and interact and like see kids like running around and having fun, uh, super positive and healing, uh, for the soul. I think for a lot of people that day, yesterday, two days ago, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, man, it, it has been weird. Can I go back to another thing you were talking about being around the house and being home and doing all that yeah. stuff? You, uh, you have a, a great thing with your wife. Oh. From what I see. Also the beautiful woman on uh on the album cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh. and again, another another theme of family through a thing. You know what I mean? It's not like some random person nobody knows on the thing. Like, like that's your wife on the cover. It's not like, you know Oh man. Well dude, Don Aaron also all of the press photos for this release we did in our backyard and she took them of me. She shot the video cuts so deep. Oh, really? Like she's the videographer on oh, all fuck, that. She did a great job. And, and my buddy, Brian, Brian McGrath did all the editing to get all the people's, uh, their clips in. Thanks for sending your clip in, by the way. I appreciate that. I didn't. <laughs> no. uh, I'm sorry. I just, it's okay. I didn't personally ask anybody. I just put a couple of things on Facebook and then it was too oh, much. Oh, good. Because uh, you know what? People were doing that through the whole year and I did some and I didn't do others. So I was like, oh, yeah, fuck. Oh, but dude, but, but, no, but the, the thing is, is, you know, I mean, Johnny, you're saying it's like Cut So Deep was written 2018, 2019 when I was gone a lot. Right. And so it's just about, it's a personal song about, me being gone and my, the relationship with my wife and the strain that it put on that. And then when everything locked down, anytime I would sing that song, it just sounded, it felt different, you know, looking at my camera, looking at people liking the little hearts going up and everything. I'm like, Oh, that's a person I went to elementary school with. That's a person that I used to see when every time I was in Seattle, yeah. that's a dude I used to volunteer in, in Micronesia with who lives in Japan now. I was like, I miss seeing your smile, miss seeing your face. And so that was one of the things that helped me build the record out. But as the songs came together and I'm agonizing over the order of the tracks, you know, a lot of, so much of this record, I had band members, managers, booking, it, it, just a, a whole team of people that I talked to. Like, what do you think about this? What are we, what, what are we going to do for this? And it's just me in charge and I'm the one who's decided to do all that. So it's just madness and, and, and ridiculousness. But Don Aaron really did step up on a lot of those um, roles or hats that one would wear. And uh, it's, it is pretty special and amazing. And I, I probably have taken it for granted a few, two time, a few too many times, but um, Don Aaron is such a, um, This is a loving person, and uh, I'm I'm fortunate. I mean, I mean, I take care of her too sometimes, but mainly she's had to take care of me most of the time. Well, I mean, it's I, I think about it, and when I see y'all, I mean, obviously, no one's like fighting at the Continental Club with their wife <laughs> when you see them, but some. I, some people, but you, most people would leave it at the door and come in and do a hangout and then go back yeah, and yeah. fight in the car on the way home. But, um, normal people, <laughs> normal. <laughs> but there is a sense of like, um, uh, of, of togetherness and unity and, and being a person who, who has done nothing but fail in every fucking relationship they've ever had. <laughs> um, you become fascinated with that. And I see somebody like you, you have the same job as me. You're gone the same times that I'm gone. You manage to have children who don't act like animals. And you know what I mean? <laughs> have clothes on and they're, <laughs> they can speak English. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it's, it's, it. How do you do that? How do you guys keep it together? That's the question. Oh, man. Okay, I've got at least three things that came to my mind. Uh, the, the biggest thing is, it, it just sounds like almost cliche, but if you're not telling the person how you really feel, then it, like just communication. Like there was a thing, you know, six months ago where I noticed 
everybody in the family, maybe on my lead. So I'm going to take full responsibility of this. When I'm obviously upset and mad about something, and then somebody says, what's wrong? And you say, nothing. I'm fine. It's like, can't say that shit anymore in this house. If, if you look visibly upset, you can say, I don't want to talk about it. I'll talk to you about it later. But you can't just say, I, I'm fine, because you're obviously not fine. And so that is going to at least open up another response for the person to have. You know, to the person who looks angry or upset or stressed out or frustrated. And on that note, the communication, I will say, personal and couples therapy, shout out to Sims Foundation, because yeah. uh, if I didn't have um, someone to talk to, especially with uh, some other things going on in my life, uh, I would be even more of a mess than I am now. And, and, you know, I don't know why this has worked other than, you know, uh, wanting it to work and uh, forgiveness is a really big thing, even for the little thing of like, not, you know, I want to be home right now. And I stayed three more hours down on rainy street after I played. It's like, it's little things like if you say you're going to, we're all going to pick up our dishes. Everybody should really try the damnedest to pick up the dishes, you know? And, yeah. and, you know, sometimes Don Aaron can do dishes so quickly. So, I mean, like, I'm over there for an hour and a half just trying to get through it. So sometimes no one wants me to do that part. Uh, but those kinds of things where all of us working together and just um, and being able to say you're sorry to someone when, you know, yeah, you know, like whatever, whoever's that joke is when someone says, uh, hey, you're, you're being mean right now. And this person's like, no, I'm not. It's like, well, it's not up for you to decide whether or not you're being mean. Everybody else right. thinks you're being mean. Yeah. And, uh, and all, all of my girls are, are good at, um, giving me a break. Uh, yeah. and I'm thankful for that. So there's also know. a lot of ladies that you got a lot of ladies in your life. Johnny. I mean, you know, that that was the, the half awake, half asleep dream that I had, uh, right after we had the twins, Zoe, my oldest daughter, who's in her early twenties, she's was kind of a, awake and asleep and thinking maybe you know dreams really do come true the dreams i had as a as a young boy watching poison and uh molly crew being surrounded by beautiful women i just didn't know the beautiful <laughs> women were going to be my daughters and my wife <laughs> <laughs> you know same thing we're in schlitterbahn everybody's in bathing suits and there's bud light and so it's like this is sort of like uh yeah, you know <laughs> what I'm saying, oh, you know i don't know Girls, 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 <laughs> at little bone in New Brown Falls. Girls, girls, girls. Okay, sorry. God. Um, my grandfather uh, uh, was this Cuban dude, super macho, four daughters, and oh, wow. uh, used to drive him crazy. Like he had he he actually also had this sense, like the the like the lady fights in my family. Hmm. They're crazy lady fights. Like the ladies, they fight. And that dude could feel it coming on. He would just get up and like go outside. <laughs> like he could hear it. He'd be like, oh, what's this? Oh, come on, let's go. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want the, 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 um, it's a known thing that dad likes to insert himself into issues and problems. And the biggest thing in this house is when, if they're, you know, my wife and my daughters tell me that they can work it out on their own. Yeah. And I know they can, but when I'm in here and it's invading my ear space, I'm like, y'all got to go outside or do something <laughs> else. It's like, or I'm going to come back here and just lecture y'all for 10 minutes on why it's important to be nice to each other and use a positive tone of voice. It's like, I don't know. They don't want that for sure. No. You know? <laughs> no. <laughs> Grad's, dad's going to talk to us again about something that he did one time a long time ago. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, the, no, but I will say this on another note, my twins are like Aster and Violet are best friends. And I'm just so lucky because I know some other uh, families and friends who only have one kid and like that kids is all alone with their parents all day in the house and yeah. it's madness. And it's, I, I can only imagine if they didn't have each other. Right. Uh, so, uh, Despite the madness, it's just uh, there, there's a lot to be thankful for and a lot to be, uh, you know, mindful of, I think. Yeah. I forget 
how old people are. <laughs> and there was a picture I saw of Zoe and she on Instagram, and she was kissing a dude. And I'm like, the fuck? Is, what's going on here? What? Did, hey. That's and then husband. I'm like, oh my <laughs> god, it's a fucking husband, dude. I'm like, it's a husband. How I thought she was eleven. Oh, yeah, no, there's a, there's definitely, I mean, that happens. I mean, granted, I, I think I can see Zoe as my daughter and her as a young adult who's married. Uh, but her friends, I still think of like as being in high school. I mean, it's not necessarily the way they act, but I'm like, oh gosh, someone's coming over. Right, They're right, always right. a little silly, you know? And uh, it's like, no, those are, uh, yeah, but even... I can't even believe that this is what's going on about like, okay, here, I know what I'm going to try to say, Johnny. Zoe's husband, Taylor, I have a son-in-law, which is wild. Uh, He is in the air force, right? My dad's in the air force. So he was retired Lieutenant Colonel. He, after he got out of basic training in San Antonio, they were going to be stationed in South Dakota. And I was like, oh, that's cool. The Badlands. You can go see. I was just trying to be positive. Right. You know? And they're like, no way. And he had a conversation with another guy in his class who was st- going to be stationed in Wichita Falls. And he, they asked their commanding officer, can we switch assignments? Or yeah. uh, uh, He said, sure. I don't care. Y'all figure it out. It's up to y'all. And so now Zoe... Uh, they live in the town where I went to high school and uh, she went from Lubbock to Wichita Falls. And, you know, you yeah. think you can't get worse, but I mean, from Lubbock, but I mean, in some ways, I've been to Wichita people, Falls. <laughs> I'm just saying as a young person starting out their marriage, right. maybe they're in Austin or Boston or New York or whatever. Right. I don't know. Um, but they're doing so great. And it is, it is a trip because uh, there's uh, some fond memories of that place for sure. Even though I, uh, some not so fun memories, but uh, but it is well. I don't know how. Yeah, did you set that up just so you could kind of get to the how did I get here? Uh, little pitch. I mean, the little tag. It's just like how how in the world are we? However old as we are now, doing this still. Yeah, I don't mind doing. Well, that. How, many, how many times have I was trying to think about? I, You've had me on this uh, podcast at least three or three or four. four I remember you did a live one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At uh, the co- uh, whatever that coffee place was. What was that place called? Strange Brew. Strange Brew. Well, this so bad. Oh wait. <laughs> uh, I also ran sound for you one time when you did it at ACL because I had a pass from someone right. like, yeah, run <laughs> it was Jackie. That, Jackie yeah, that Benson. was just a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah. Jackie like, Benson. Jackie yeah. Benson's had the best pivot. Oh God, man! She was. It's not even that hard. She's like, I'll just do what I do on stage in front of my phone with all of my little, you know, spaceship thing down there. And uh, I mean, if you look at how many like streams her live streams are getting, it's just insane. Polestar had her up there as like one of the top ten yeah. last year <laughs> in the world. Yeah. I mean, I, I think yeah. I remember her playing like when she was still in high school, getting out of school, and then we were. Uh, oh yeah, she's so phenomenal. It's great. Yeah, great artist. Um, so let me ask you this: In the, I know your record came out on Friday, but what are you? What's next? What's next? <laughs> I'm going. I'm going full this. Alejandro will, on you. No, it's easy. I do it. Thank God, I have a plan. Uh, and I did this a couple of months ago. You know, like, well, what are you going to do once this actually happens? After doing this for so long, it's good to have uh, the plan go throughout the thing. And so probably within the next month or so, the Labor Department project's going to be releasing its its record. And uh, that is Nolan Wheeler from the Wheeler Brothers mm-hmm. is the singer. And, uh, and his brother, Pat. Uh, doing a lot of drums on there. And then this guy named Misha Hercules from LA. A great name. And I was like, I, w- I always thought that was like a s- stage name. That's like his real name, Misha Hercules. And he's the producer and the engineer on everything. And I was 
lyrics guy. Like no one wanted me to sing or play the guitar and anything. And this is very, uh, this project I'm so excited about. It's, it was just like, a a team of un- almost unlikely characters, like one of those movies you see where it's like, we came together, the four of us to figure this out. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the stuff that, the songs that Nolan and I would write here in Austin on a piano and a guitar. When we took that to LA to have Misha try to do that. I mean, you know, it's, it's discouraging when you work for a couple of weeks and you've got a set of songs and you bring them out there and he just says no to all of them. You know, like, mm, you know, <laughs> moving through songs, switching things up, this project, uh, you know, and I don't know what we're going to do with it now either. I mean, you know, the, cause we're not going on the road or anything, yeah, yeah. but, but there are, um, it is uh, nothing like I've ever done before. Uh, and just being a part of that is fun. I do have two other. What's more, the name of that band? The, the la- labor department. Okay. And I don't know if the, the handles are just D E P T period or, or department. I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll send you a link to that. Okay. I promise. Um, but then there's also, um, I got, I have, like around the fall of last year, I started trying to do some, um, collaborations with other people about, I wanted to do one cover and one original of mine that I hadn't been able to finish with a friend or somebody else here in Austin. And then I thought I should do it with people, not just in Austin, just I can send, we can send files now. So I was going to, as I'm hitting up people in New York and some other places. And the first uh, one was really bringing in uh, Ephraim this past December. And we did uh, have yourself a merry little Christmas. And uh, dude, it was just like the funnest thing ever to have him come in. I haven't seen him in so long and, Oh, it was just beautiful. I was like, I need to make sure I do more of this. We can go to Patrick's studio, Signal Hill, where we did the whole record. Everything's safe and everything's cool. And let's, we can still record music together. It's not crazy, you know? Um, And then I guess right in January, uh, I had Kalu James and Sidney Wright come out and we were going to do, if we if the original song didn't work, I was thinking we could do some Crosby, Stills, and Nash song. But then they really liked this scratch take of a song that I'd been writing three years ago that still didn't have anything with it, or I only had one verse or something. And, dude, in one day, the, the, the studio, those two, just ha- having someone else with a suggestion, you know, uh, there's so many bands that I've been in where it's the band members are side guys, essentially. They're not deciding what kind of bridge, what chord we're doing right, to, or, you right. know, uh, but working with Kalu and Sydney, just, just so awesome. And that song is going to be coming out, uh, probably April or something. Uh, and then there's another project where I'm using uh, a couple of the boys from wooden wire, Tony Camel and uh, Dom Fisher. Uh-huh. And we're going to be, Doing a new song of mine that I wrote during the pandemic, the day John Prine died. Uh, we're going to do that song together, and so I'm just going to be keep. I'm going to keep on doing little projects to where the album came yeah. out, and it to get together for a song, and just spend you know a normal day in the studio to flush it out, and then instead of it just sitting on a hard drive like all some of these songs on Cut So Deep did for yeah, years, yeah, 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 record them, get them out, and then just keep plugging away. Yeah. Uh, I'll send you a version of that one too. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, to I'll, they're super good. Um, I feel weird. Like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Am I split? Can I ask you questions? Sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, what are, you, what are you up to? Well, I've, I've been, I've been writing and, and I've been recording. I have uh, three songs mastered already and two songs still in the, in the, in the, the pot or whatever yeah yeah i've been doing some stuff with a bunch of stuff with gabe Rhodes, and uh and john chipman yeah and so john chipman the, the drummer guy yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's what i was thinking yeah he he played on my last record um too i i uh i've never it's we it's weird i used to have these you know, intense control issues about music and how you play it. And then, I mean, even like, I was just talking about it with John the other day. We recorded a song a week ago and 
and he was like, you're just so easy to work with. And Gabe, of course, has a, gets a different side of me than John does. So he yeah. starts laughing. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, that's no one, people don't normally even say that to me. <laughs> and he was like, well, I was like, you know, you've never gotten me to go like, just give me your drumsticks. I'll show you what I'm doing. <laughs> and of course, I'm nowhere near the drummer that any drummer that's played with me, but I'm telling them like what to do. But really like with John, it's amazing. It's like magic. Like he just says, what do you want me to play? And then I say like, I don't know. And then the first thing he does is amazing, you know? Hey, I, Johnny, I've done that to a drummer. I, I'm obviously not a drummer, but it's like, okay, I'm just going to play what I feel like I think it should sound like. And then, you know, it never translates as well as, well as, you, as you might hope. But uh, sometimes you can, I can convey an idea. Oh, yeah. Like, if I were to play this in time, this sort of beat, that's what I want you to sure. do right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of times it's beneath their pay scale because we as non-drummer musicians, we don't think of like the the Terry Bozio, like fucking, you know what I mean? Like I said, no, it's this thing where it goes, toom, pa, toom, pa, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, I would lose my mind if someone was like, I mean, Johnny, there were a few examples of that, of like the control issues about uh, just so many things, even artistically, like, whether it's the mix of the song right. and, and, and why I kind of chose Don Aaron for the cover. Uh, I, I have two photographs that were a little bit older, but it was right after I cut my dread. So it was still, I guess, accurate in a way, but I was just like, Oh, I'm going to use one of those photos for the cover. It's going to be that easy. And they look awesome. And I'm pumped. It's easy to, cause they're professional. They're high res. They're all you need. It's going to be great. And the more I kept going with it, you know, just some photo editing and some things happening, uh, I kept getting just uncomfortable because Patrick even said, he's like, maybe, maybe you're so uncomfortable with all this because you were just kind of taking the easy way out choosing one of these photos for this record, you know? And I listened, I was listening to some of the tracks. I was like, what? do I want to be on the cover of this record? I don't really want an image of me. I don't want my face. Uh, and I had an image that one of Holly Bronkow took when we got married. And it was like, I was like, I think there's a picture of Don Aaron. She's got all these like uh, flags and stuff waving. I can't even remember it. Holly had to go through all these hard drives to find it. And um, I just thought, you know, what was it? I just watched the documentary on the making of Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. And the cover of that record is just white with a little picture of a guy on fire shaking the other dude's hand. And there's no words on the front. And I was like, yeah, I don't have to put any words on the cover of my record. Everybody's going to know what it is if they're looking at it. And, you know, I'm the one who's deciding this. I'm the decider, as George W. Bush would say, you know, like, so not, not just wanting, but having to take control of some of these artistic things, the, the insane control, insane control issues. Like there were some mixes too, where, you know, Patrick's listening to the snare drum and I'm listening to the two backing vocal tracks. I'm like, dude, the snare sounds fine. And he yeah. goes, no, it doesn't, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so to get to the end of all this is a, uh, it's wacky to think about, man. Yeah. I've learned the art of when you get some, it took me a long time, but I learned the art of when somebody mixes your record to leave them alone until they are ready for you to hear something. Cause then they're, it's that same thing. Like they're working on something. You're like, Oh, Hey man, can you, and they're like, dude, <laughs> definitely. You gotta leave. <laughs> dialing you something leave. in. Yeah. 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 You just leave. You don't, you don't even hang out for the next few hours while they mix it. You're just like, I'm going to get out of here and let you mess right, around right. with this for a while. Are you really taking Send the bass out for the second verse? Like, leave me alone <laughs> like yeah maybe he is actually maybe yeah. they are that's yeah hilarious yeah i've uh you know what else i've been doing that's been great is uh mm. the austin music foundation artist development program i've been doing that for a few years yes. with uh my friend yeah. and How's Alex that? Alejo. great we just did yeah. another one we i mean we did this one totally under lockdown and i mean there was there, it, it, it was different but it was good yeah yeah, no, I, I, love, I mean, dude, um, yeah, AMF is just super awesome. I mean, I, I actually did know that, but um, that's cool. Um, 
uh, what, my daughter is actually in the same class as Alex's daughter. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty wild. Uh, so that's you and Anar and you and Anar and Alex and Alex. Yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, we're the ones, we're the mentors in it. But yeah, 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 yeah. And then am I thinking this up? Is that a, oh, I don't want to say it. It's, um, I feel like did, did y'all just get a new like person le- on, on the team or something? Well, Alex, uh, for the next year, won't be one of the mentors anymore because now he's the vice president and that guy, Saul Paul, became the president. Saul Paul, the that's yeah, what yeah. it was. Yeah. That was Saul Paul yeah, yeah. joined the team. He's one of yeah. the ambassadors. He's, he, no, he's the president of the whole board and everything. Okay, that's what I thought it was. I was somebody joined, I remember reading, and he's such a cool dude too, man. Dang. He is a cool dude, isn't he? I, don't, I know I did one show, it was like a kid's show, or something. It was some. It was something, and uh, that's where I met him. But then, kind of like when once you meet someone and they're on your radar, and then it's either you start seeing them everywhere, but yeah. they were there all the time. Maybe you just didn't see them. But uh, right, right. Yeah, dude. That's that's awesome. Well, that's great, man. I mean, you know, they're doing beautiful things. Yeah, I mean, trying. It's 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 definitely like a fucked up time because, like, you know, when you when you look at it's difficult to raise money anyway for a nonprofit, let alone when you have these other nonprofits where there's ham and Sims that like people's lives depend on them. (laughs) You're like, Oh no. Hey man, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you, you know, how to book a gig in this place or that place. But we've really been able to pivot also and, and sort of like move all of our shit online. And some of it, I think will continue to stay online even after, because it's just so much easier. I think there are those things that, that that are developed that have been developed since this uh that that will stay yeah. you know like that i mean he, the artist development uh oh dude i will say this i'm about to start up my guitar lessons again that i was doing uh with kids in the neighborhood uh-huh. and like re- remembering that when i left college i went to go teach overseas and it's like the the teacher aspect of this of um i can admit that the teaching the C chord and the ukulele to an eight year old, it can be kind of stressful at times and it can get old, but there's some older students that are, they didn't say they wanted to sing songs or write songs, but now that during the the lockdown, they've gotten better at playing and they're starting to sing. Oh, that's cool. And dude, look, even your face, one of my students, she said, I started writing a song. I was like, you did? About what? And she goes, "Mm." and I was like, Oh wait, you don't have to tell me this. Yeah. 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 It's like, but if you ever want to talk about it, I'd love to talk to you about it. And getting excited about some of those things is um, on top of the music. And because uh, wait, y'all are doing the artist development thing where y'all y'all select people. Yeah, it's kind of like a part of the program right. for and then, a year or something. Well, for, it's like six months, and then we okay. last year added a recording component where we make a record. Everyone goes in and records a song. Uh, with Frenchie Smith this year, this year people got to record too, but you know, in that, that experience too, man, I mean, part of my, my, I, you know, Mark Hallman, right? The oh yeah. Okay. okay. So that guy, like when I was 13, took me in and gave me this life. Right. So I've seen the photo of you in his studio. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, this, the, he, he's, he's like outside of my mother the person that's had the most impact on me as a human being. That's the truth. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> what I, forgot, I even at? forgot what I was saying. I just got, uh, no, we were talking about each song coming in. Y'all were, they got to do right. two okay. songs. Okay. <laughs> so, right. So the thing is that this means something to me because there are people like Steven Doster, like Alejandro, like Hallman, like a bunch of dudes that made sure that I was doing the right thing. John D, people like that, people that just like look after you. And what I was starting, I start getting worried that we all need to hold up our end and bring up the next generation because there just aren't that many left. Well, when it's strange when someone asks me a question, like, I guess even in some of these interviews for some of these write-ups in this record, like, you know, what do you? What would you have to say to someone starting out their career since you've been doing this so long? I'm like, what are you talking about doing this so long? Like, 
but when some people ask, I can think of some people in the last, you know, five, 10 years that have asked me my opinion on touring or how do I do this or right, fat, right. just, just right. information. And after that, they have picked up the, the reins and they are, you know, kicking ass right now. And it's like, there are some of those uh, roles that, like you said, like I got to see John D when they were doing the thing and like having music at the voting booths mm-hmm. and it was like me and then John D and Bonnie Whitmore was before me and getting to see them. Oh, just like heart exploding. And I'm like, Oh, John D you're still like the coolest dude ever. It's like these him and, you know, I was like, you, you obviously have, uh, you know, some time under your belt before me, but it's the, your notion of our role and responsibility to just they don't have to be necessarily younger, but people who haven't done this as long, there's, there is something there. There is something there. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's obvious that I'm not, you know, this isn't the first record I, I had to count. It's like, I don't know how many this is. There's over 10 records that I've put out. And it's like, oh, yeah, maybe I do know something about this. And I don't have to listen <laughs> yeah. to my personal opinion about this shit is right now. It's like, yeah. oh, it's neat that you think that, but that's not what we're doing. Um, and, I, and I will say that it's, it's taken people like Alejandro to, to make me realize that, you know, you, why don't you decide this? You know, yeah. God, I mean, there's just some things that like little moments like that, that can pit, pivot and can change the rest of your decisions yeah. after that. Yeah. As, as, as I'm obviously still talking about this comment that he made to me years later. Um, it's true though. Um, yeah. That stuff to me is just, it's, it's just really like you giving guitar lessons to the kids and your name, like this, whatever you oh, can yeah. do to make sure that this keeps going. <laughs> Oh man, that I this know. community and, keeps going, like just keeps growing and keeps bringing new people in and more talented people. The younger people, do, we, we need more songwriters. And it's like, uh, and actually, Nolan and I, when we start, first started working together in 2017 in October, I ran this big white truck, took my parking spot on Rainy Street when I, I did the residency for five years down on Rainy Street at Bungalow. And I'm trying to park and this truck pulls up and I'm like, dude, they saw me try to pull in there and I pull up beside it and it's my buddy Nolan. And he's like, what are you doing? I was like, you're giving me that parking spot. Like, yeah. and he's there laughing. He's like, I'm just getting some food. I'm like, oh, I'm about to play a show. So, uh, but that night we hung out and he said, man, so good. And the Wheeler brothers and I used to go on tour up Oregon, Colorado. I mean, we've been on things together back uh, when they were doing their thing. He said, man, I booked a date at Mark Hallman's place uh, in two days. And I'd love to have you come and just help out with lyrics or whatever when I'm working on it. And Mark did uh, a lot of stuff with the Wheeler Brothers. And that was my first time to actually get to go into the studio. And we went in there a while before Misha, I mean, Misha wanted us to start coming out and work with him. And it was like, I, we were all having so much fun at South Congress Studios and just walking into his place is just a, oh, yeah. it's a library of just, I mean, I, I spent most of the time just walking around looking at pictures. Yeah. It's just a beautiful, uh, wild, wild, wild thing to think about. And, uh, you know, had he not been there at the beginning of us working together, just to kind of work it all together and figure out how everybody was going, I don't think we would have been able to do what we, we ended up doing with it. Uh, you know, uh, that's wild. Yeah. Yeah. He's a magical. Did you ever see that? Did you see the shopkeeper? The movie that they made about Holman, the documentary. No, uh-uh. it's pretty awesome, man. Cause it's not, I, it, it's, it's not just like, it's definitely not just me that like that dude picked up strays <laughs> and like, <laughs> and like got them on their feet. And gave wow. them to, like, yeah, it's not just me. It's weird when you watch that movie, you're like, wow, there's like a whole family of like the children of Hallman that he never actually tired, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you know, what's even crazier is you even mentioned the most earlier is uh, Doster. I mean, like oh, he and I remember when I moved here before, you know, it's like you did. There are so many cats like that. You didn't, 
you don't have to have a card or you don't have to have anything that says, Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a right, valid right. person yeah. you can talk to. But some of those, some of these cats, like some of these shows, like I remember at a Saxon pub show talking to Steven Doster and he was trying to leave, but then we started chatting. Then we started talking about records. Then we started talking about Bill Hicks. Then we started, oh. And he ended up canceling whatever he was supposed to go do because he just wanted to talk to me. And yeah. I think because you realize that they have this, all these experiences that when someone's like, you knew this person, yeah. he's like, oh, I'll probably just stay and talk to this guy for a little bit. Just to, you yeah. know, like, yeah, he's that cool, man. I mean, um, it's wild. Yeah. Yes. It, he's, he's a wealth of Bill Hicks knowledge too, man. Oh, that's the, the we got off of records and then we try yeah. to go back to music and then we start talking about, he's like, the last thing he said that night, He's like, his leather jacket's hanging in my closet. I was oh, like, wow. <laughs> so cool. Dude, you know, yeah, he, he, what does he like collect dudes clothes? He's got like cowboy shirts from James Honeyman Scott from the pretenders. <laughs> I didn't know that at all. He's got like, a, he's got like his own little rock and roll hall of fame museum going on in there. Oh, and on that note, that's a funny thing. Like we were left and, uh, I don't know if I saw it. Jesse Dayton. I love hanging Jesse out Dayton. with him. He's another just. I know he's a he's a pretty young looking. I mean, he's not a young looking dude, but sometimes he tells he he's telling a story, and I'm like, "There's no way this is true." And then he shows you a picture of him, and like, you know, uh, John Lee Hooker hanging out in a hotel in L.A. in the early '80s. You're like, "What? I just that can't be true." Yeah, uh, there are there. Yeah, are. he's like, he's another one. Of the stories, the well wellspring of knowledge, and uh, dude, he's also like. Uh, it's almost like he's like the Forrest Gump of our of of, of our people, because like literally you can't name something. He's like, I mean, I bet even if you said like Ricky Martin, he'd be like, Oh yeah, man, I played with that dude. On <laughs> you're like, yeah. No, yes, I did. Ricky, Rick, Ricky wanted me to be in his band, but I couldn't. Do it. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's true though. He's there's uh, there's always a story, uh, pretty impressive one too. He. Day. As soon as uh, as soon as the vaccination, did you ever see the movie that he made, Zombex? He made this zombie no, movie. But, no, but I know about it. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> so the premise is, is that is that uh, the people of New Orleans are so depressed after after Katrina that the government decides that they're going to just put them all on these antidepressants. But it turns out that these antidepressants turn you into zombies, right? Oh my god! So, so obviously, we're dealing with these vaccinations, and every time I see like a crazy headline, I send it to him, and I'm like, I think it's time for Zombex Part Two, man. Let's get oh, this man, going, dude. Yeah. I did not know that. That is, uh, I think the last time I saw him was at the thing downtown when they were like the Save Our Stages type of uh -huh. thing, uh, and uh, you know, man, that was just on that note. Uh, Patrick, my drummer who recorded the record, right. he was about to be going on tour with Jesse this year as his drummer for like almost the entire year until it all shut down. Shit. And uh, I hadn't seen Jesse, but like that day, I hadn't seen anybody really. And I mean, I had heart pounding because I'm not going to be around anybody because I'm only around my parents right. and my family. But dude, not seeing anybody, but then to see all of your musician friends, which we never got to hang out anyway, all at the same time ever. Yeah. Cause we're all playing in different places yeah. on that, whatever said night, yeah. unless it's some kind of benefit. And, uh, I was, uh, pretty emotional that day. Jesse got up and got fired up. It was yeah. funny. Uh, he was a little bit more pissed off. Kevin Russell was like, let's save everybody. And yeah, yeah. hallelujah. And, uh, <laughs> Jesse was a little bit more angry about things, but, uh, it, it's wild, man. It's even wild talking to you and seeing your face, man. It's yeah. so great. It's great to see you. you. Look, you look so great. And this Aww. man, this record. I know we haven't <laughs> we've talked about it, but I think we covered a lot of life stuff. This is a special yeah. episode where two dudes catch up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and we one of us. We're still doing the same shit we've been doing for a really long time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there was one time I had fun. AJ Vallejo on here, and it was Vallejo was putting out an album, and the first thing I said was like. So tell me about this album. He's like, it's our 15th album. Vallejo put out an album. That's it. Let's talk about fun <laughs> stuff. <laughs> there could be, I mean, 
if there weren't such a backstory behind all of this, I mean, sometimes you got to create the story or find the story. And sometimes it's like, I mean, some of the singles that I did from since 2016 were just, that's what they were. It's like, Oh, here's this song. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying, like, what are you doing next? It's like, well, I'm just going to put this single out so that there's something Something out. Yeah. And, um, I love it. It's the 15th record we put out. That's, that's the story. Just put that in the headline. And, uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well dude i love this record people should listen to it you are a phenomenal fucking songwriter and i like oh. that you go in and you're kind of like uh doing that you're, what was that guy's name? robert hunter is that the guy that used to write lyrics for the dead oh yeah robert yeah, yeah. hunter that yeah, is yeah yeah that's a yeah. cool thing I, I i there was a guy in my life named kevin hunter who had that role he would come and lay down in the room where my band and i were playing and he would go and come up with lyrics and stuff. Oh, amazing stuff. And he, a lot of times he would take what I was mumbling and write it down. What he thought I was saying. That is a huge part of where Misha would get Nolan in the, uh, and we, he was at DTLA studios and, you know, um, uh, Dennis Herring uh-huh. is the owner of that studio. And so the producer guy, right? was, yeah. And Misha was his, um, you know, the engineer. Uh huh. So Misha got discounted rates in the days in the studio, but Dennis Herring did both of Modest Mouse records. His he did. Uh, I mean, not the list go on, but he, from Counting Crows to Buddy Guy to yeah. But his first record was his first hit was uh, "A Future So Bright." I gotta wear shades, yeah. and he Pat. got like the poster sign. It's like I didn't realize how old that song was either. But that studio was so awesome. And Dennis would come in every once in a while to hear what we're working on. And uh, it's pretty awesome to not like, it's pretty hard to not fan out on someone. Right, because right. one thing I didn't want to ask about, I didn't want him to ask about all these other things. I was like, so your work with Daniel Lanois, and he was like, that was Misha's role. He was Daniel Lanois' right. engineer and worked on that Dylan record in New Orleans and uh, on uh, Is that Mercy. Is Mercy, that- oh, Mercy, oh, Mercy. Oh, Mercy, yeah, yeah. And the night that he came in, I was a little, a little oiled up and I just couldn't shut up. And you know what? He couldn't stop telling me stories. Like everybody else was just listening to all of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, well, what are you, what are you doing this in this group? I was like, oh, I usually just lay on that couch over there and try to figure out what no one's singing in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you should say, are you, what are you saying right there? You should say this. They're like, that sounds great. What were you saying? Not that. We weren't saying that. Uh, it was a pretty awesome job, to be to be honest. Yeah. Uh, See, Dennis Herring but, did, uh, there's this band, The Innocence Mission, that's oh, one, of my, one of my favorite bands. And he wait, did one of my favorite records of theirs. I was thinking of The Innocence Project. That's what it was. Not The Innocence Mission. What is, who is that? They were this band from the early 90s, mid 90s. They played them on the KGSR back in the day. Uh, they were one of Mark Hallman's favorite bands, one of my favorite bands. We would go see them when they came to town. Innocence Mission, right? The Innocence Mission. Yeah, and hey, check this out, Johnny. Like when we did uh, Sun Radio last week, I was trying to go back and find this picture of some one of the times at at a uh, Guero's at Guero's mm-hmm. uh, in, the, in the Oak Garden. And when I found the picture I was looking for, it was a lot older than I thought like 2008 or something like that. It was with Larry Monroe and KDRP. And, oh, yeah. uh, and, and there's a, a picture I found of Larry and the band and I, uh, I mean, not long before he passed away. And uh, I was like, Oh gosh, it's just a, you know, and thinking, doing something for a while and finding a picture like that. It was, uh, you know, there's uh like, and I will say this, if we're going to talk about the record, the song, This Town, uh, song before the last song. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it's just a thing. like when you hear these stories like you're talking about, all these classic people, it's like, you know, yeah, it, it's got a whole lot of stories to tell, a whole lot of heart. It was better back then. Is what a lot of people say, but they've been saying that since I got here almost 20 years ago. And that's what they were saying. Like before Liberty lunch, it was the armadillo. And before that it was this, you know I mean? Like there was always the place that was cool. And if you ask people who hung out at armadillo world headquarters, 
They're like, well, that was that was when it was the coolest shit ever. Actually, you know, it was Dylan and uh, the Grateful Dead, and the Clash came through, and right, I mean, right. what, nothing like this. But um, the thing that's hard, so hard about it is, you could really go almost anywhere in Austin and find that blues jam or find that open mic. And some of these places, you would see people who are already well established and have careers and people who are just up there cutting their teeth, trying their best, whether they sound good or not. And as depressing as that could be sometimes as also now it just seems like so uh, inspirational in, in, in a way to think that how normal it was for, um, for anybody just to get off the bus here in Austin and I'm going to be a songwriter. Yeah. I'm going to write songs. Yeah. I want to join the, the legacy of, uh, of this town. Yeah. Uh, it's not Nashville. It's not LA and it's not New York. Uh, it's not New Orleans. Uh, it's its own thing. And, uh, it's great to hear you tell stories and talk about all this stuff and, uh, talk about all these people that are so influential. Uh, yeah. Keeping it going. There's a, I've, I've always been appreciative of it, but not, not as much as I have over the last year, not really being able to see anybody, you know? Yeah. Exactly. You realize that, like, whatever time you and me ran into each other at the Continental Club in Houston, out of the blue, <laughs> just that kind of, just that kind of thing, like that. That's a soul feeding experience, even if it's for two and a half minutes. Like you fucking embrace oh, dude, your friend. The last friend. two times I've seen Scrappy, I think we're on plane somewhere, like leaving Chicago, and I'll get on the plane, and it's like a whole cast of just ne'er-do-wells for that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guys are a little bit older than me and it's like kind of loud and i'm looking and i'm like well there's scrappy and i think that's bruce and i don't know where are y'all coming from or who's doing something and uh and who else was on the peterson brothers were on that flight and uh i was coming back from new york and it's like dude i, w I wonder if the airplane knows how fortunate they are to have all of us <laughs> 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 hope this plane doesn't go down jesus yeah or there it um, goes you know his phenomenal Sydney Wright. There's that's a person oh. that gives me hope for the future. She's so talented, such a great well, songwriter, her, singer, musician. I met her as a sound engineer. She was running sound. Oh right, yeah, time. yeah. <laughs> and Patrick said, "Oh, uh, he worked on some gig where she was running sound." But then he said, "Have you heard her music?" I was like, "Oh no." Uh, it's like she's a songwriter. She performs everything and. Uh, it was one of those things you kind of blown away and just in awe of the, of the talent, the skill, the creativity. And then I saw Kalu talking to her and they're like best friends. And I was like, yo, Kalu, you got it. Can we all hang out and sing songs together? Please yeah. just tell. And so then we've done a few shows together where just us three, it's uh, there's some kind of. Uh, I'd love to see I, that. I don't know copacetic kind of like just balance and, and flow of like they're so good vocally i'm definitely the weakest link in that whole group but they're you're know, like oh you sing here i'll sing here oh yeah. no you want to sing this lower part and i'm just like well let's just keep going with this but she's uh definitely uh yeah pretty amazing i'm she's excited about this book. she seems like uh I've, i watched her record when she was in the artist development program and she was doing a song at the bubble that I was there for. And mm -hmm. it's what I imagine Prince working like that. I just imagine that it's that that's what it must've been like. Wow. Like someone that can just do everything themselves and comes up she with really, shit, like hitting herself on the chest for the kick drum and shit like that, where you're just like, how are you the coolest person in the world? <laughs> uh, did you, see, did you see Prince in the new video? Did I see Prince in the new video, in your new video? Yeah, someone just asked me this, and I didn't. And uh, Adrian Casada has a little Prince doll that has played the guitar part, if you go back and look at uh, it. Again. I was like, Prince is in the video? <laughs> Speaking of Prince, Jesus. I know, man. Uh, um, well, dude, this has been great catching up. Is there anything I'm missing? People just go to GrahamWilkinson.com. You keep that updated. Or uh, Graham Wilkinson media. Media. Graham, Graham Wilkinson music.com. And then all everything is Graham Wilkinson music. The Sorry. Instagram. Handle. I wrote down the wrong thing. Why did I miss music? It's okay. Um, yeah. And the more and more stuff on YouTube, doing more videos, figuring that out, uh, getting ready for the release. I watched, 
I don't know how many hours of uh, YouTube videos about what it is and the growing people and trying to, you know, there's something about that platform that I like more, even though I'm still just live streaming on Facebook. But right, Friday yeah. night we did the, uh, the live stream where we went to all of the platforms and uh, it's pretty wild. Like I said, there's a whole, like how much do you want to put into it? Like that's why I said this whole year, I've been like, the phone sounds fine. That's I barely make it to the back porch with my guitar and my phone on time. When I say everybody, I'm going to be there. I'm still late for that. So, I mean, I can't, <laughs> if I had to set anything up other than just leaning my phone up against something, it would be a, a, a complete headache for sure. Yeah. Um, but thanks for having me, man. Dude, it's this great been, catching um, up. It's great, yeah, to, it's see really great to see you. Yeah. Nice too, to catch man. a glimpse of the of the famous Don Aaron. Oh, and she just walked in right at the beginning. She yeah. did. Yeah. Um yeah, dude. Uh people get out there and check this out. Cut so deep, gorgeous record, Graham Wilkinson Music dot com. And videos on YouTube. You but you find I like I like people to still go to the website. And I actually like going mm-hmm. to the website because you can just as long as your website has links to everything there, it's a good yeah, centralized there, there location. Is. Plus, we have yeah, to pay for them, part, and I want people to go to them and see them. <laughs> oh, I know, man. It's it's wackadoo. I've been saying that whole uh, wackadoo. It's the whole thing's crazy. It's like oh, six different platforms. Like oh, we're gonna stream your song on fifteen different platforms. Right. Like no, why? What? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Well, dude. Well, hey, dude. What, what's up? Let me love say, you, man. Let you. <laughs> love you too, man. Thanks so much, John. Yeah, no problem, buddy. On a book so uneasy and it just can't seem to reconcile all the pain. Graham Wilkinson, always great talking to him. What a lovely, lovely man and his lovely family. It was a great conversation, right? I love it. Get out and check out his album, Cut So Deep, available wherever it is that you stream and download your jams. You can find him at GrahamWilkinsonMusic.com. And don't forget, when you're out there checking out Graham Wilkinson, you can subscribe to this podcast, wherever it is you find podcasts, be it Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, Anywhere. New shows all the time. Still one more. This week, there's three shows. Next week, there's three shows. And then in, in, in the first official week of April, we go back to, uh, to two shows a week. Okay? All right. Well, look. Let's hear the rest of this song by Graham Wilkinson. Have a great week, whatever it is you're doing. Let's get down. See you. Really-